Bom dia. You can see that stenting is an art. It's an art, and we have a, a few tools, but I like to use all the information from the IVIS to help me understand how to do it well, because it's hard to come back. You have to do it right the first time. And I'm trying to tell you now about stents that don't stay open. And since there's no certification and very, um, how do I say, disorganized teaching of how to treat veins and stent, uh, we have a lot of people who get stents and the stents are then closing. So we have a big problem here with the number of stents that are not staying open, even though, and we don't really know how many stents are put in per year. The companies try to tell us because they do the marketing, but uh, we know that there are a lot of stents that are closing because we get those people referred to us with chronically occluded stents and they're very difficult to open compared to a native vein that is closed for years. I mean, it's much easier to open up someone's vein than someone's occluded stent. So I'm gonna show you what I've learned. And these are my disclosures, which I completely forgot yesterday. So there's this epidemic, and we really don't know the numbers. We've submitted this abstract to the American Venus Forum so we can discuss what we've learned from opening up a, a, few, uh, you know, a, sh a small number of these. Chronic occlusions are really bad for the society because they're very expensive to treat. Uh, the problem is for the uh, patients. They can't find any doctors who even know how to do it or recognize it. And the insurance companies uh, have to pay an extraordinary amount to get these stents reopened. So the main problem for stents failing is they have poor inflow or poor outflow or both. And I'm going to show you, th this is something that has to be evaluated uh, with lots of ultrasound before you go in, so you go in at the right place. A lot of doctors will go into the common femoral and not know that they have a distal iliac lesion. So they only treat the common iliac and then they have a problem below that they don't recognize until their stent occludes the first week. And then there's this effect that I call the python effect. You can see that the stent is widened here because this vein was narrow here from chronic disease and here it wasn't so bad and here it had chronic disease. Let's say this is all in the iliac and when you use a high pressure balloon, maybe 16 or 18 to try to open this part and this part, then this part opens up so wide because it's more, it gives way here. You get this wide stent and I call it like a python eating a a goat, I guess. But uh, what happens is the body wants to make the flow the same here and here. And when this is wider here, the pressure builds up on this in this area and the flow goes slower because it's narrow here. So there's increased pressure here, lower pressure here, and that's exactly a, a manifestation of the Bernoulli effect. So it will build up thrombus on the sides of the stents in order to self-correct the flow pattern. And we see this all the time. If you put in too big of a stent, you will get buildup on the edges and it will start to close down the stent. And it may, you know, this is circumferential, so it may get even more than that um, as time goes by. So why does this happen to these these patients and why is this a problem for us clinically? There's poor training in some places, inadequate evaluations of venous anatomy before stenting, suboptimal placements of stents are not understanding this flow uh, pattern. Small stack stents are the worst. If a doctor is used to using short, small stents, and that's what he's been doing in arterial work, he changes to vein work and only uses what he knows. He's using the wrong stent in the veins. Large short stents are also not good because they have a tendency to migrate. And no knowledge of hypercoagulability. They're treating these people post. They do a procedure, but they don't anticoagulate them adequately. 
And then they don't keep track of these patients. Six months later, they don't know if the patient is still patent. And unfortunately, with the way medicine is, the patient can go to a different doctor or the insurance company will say, you have to go to that doctor, not the doctor who treated you. And so you get a lot of discontinuation or it's very dysfunctional to try to get continuity of care. We are constantly fighting insurance companies to treat the same patient year after year. So the big question is this, I have this for you. If any of you have done arterial work before you start to doing vein work, would you do an aorta by femme graft in a patient who had no runoff? I mean, I used to do a lot of arterial work. So I know you have to do a runoff in order before you figure out if you stent someone. And so the same thing is happening in veins. Why would you stent the iliac veins if you don't know that the flow in this leg is coming into that stent system? For example, in this lady that just got stented, we don't know what the femoral leg looks like, the popliteal and the tibial. We don't have a venogram of that particular leg. It would be a good idea to see that there's good flow. There appears to be good flow, but you can be deceived when you inject contrast through your uh, sheath that's in your femoral because you're giving that artificial push of contrast into the flow and sometimes you miss things. So it's good to know uh, all the anatomy of the leg. It's a total system and you can't just focus on the iliac without knowing the rest. Now we did 45 patients that we have analyzed so far. We have more, but we have good data on this many patients. Most of them are female. Average age is young, 43. 15 of the 45 patients had only one revision, but these are all chronically occluded stents. And they have been included for uh, a number of months to years, most of them at least uh, six to months to two or three years. Revising the stent occlusion required an average of 3.5 procedures in a number of the people. It's not easy to do this. It's not a one-shot thing. It's, not a, it's very hard to get into some of these stents because what happens is they're uh, crimped or uh, machucado at the area of the iliac, and so they don't open well because they're not round, they're all flat. I'm gonna show you some pictures. So 11 of the 45 failed to open. Um, the duration of the occlusion, as you can see, was quite long. So the primary patency at one year is pretty low because we have to go in and do a second procedure to keep the patency open, and sometimes you need to put in additional stents and you need to anticoagulate them thoroughly after they've had this much endovascular work. The standard guide wire traversal is fairly possible, high percentage, but may I mention that sometimes we have to use the back end of the wire, like it's a, like a, a coat hanger, because you need something sharp. So we're, we, we don't have good tools for this uh, uh, procedure. Devices were successfully used off-label, which I'll mention, at least 20% of the time, maybe more. And what we've been doing is we've been using the guide wire backwards and we've been using laser catheters and sometimes the rotational thrombectomy device called the pathway or jet stream. And those are totally used off-label. The representatives just go like this. They don't want to see it. But they're tools that we've used so much because we want to try to open these stents and re Restent them so the patients have a good leg. So I'm going to show you a short history of this man, a 42-year-old man who came to me. He was shot when he was young. He said he wasn't doing anything wrong, but he was shot in the groin when he was 23, and they embolized his external internal iliac artery, did a patch repair, and he had progressive stenosis, which gave him a DVT a number of years later. And then a doctor in Phoenix put in a stent in 2017. It was only a 12 millimeter nitinol stent. Put him onto Xeralto, and then he stopped the Xeralto, the stent occluded, and he came to see us for the uh, vision. So here we are with his leg before. He had collaterals in his pelvis. He was rather symptomatic. His femoral vein looked terrible. And here's the upper thigh femoral vein. And in this case, we use the Zabel catheter to get up through this old, totally occluded femoral vein, which makes my point. You can't put your stent uh, 
in uh, the uh, veins without good inflow. And you can see how much collateralization he had here with this is the stent. Now he had two stents. They're both nitinol and they're open. They're short and they're open cell nitinol stents. This is the Zabel catheter, which has two different tips. It's a very good catheter now for chronic disease. I think Dr. Ossie will mention that. But you see these stents. Here's the embolization coil from years ago. Here's the bullet. That's a piece of bullet still there. And here we are trying to get up with small wires, 018 wires. The trouble with these open stent, uh, open cell stents is that you can go through the stent cells very easily. That's why I prefer wall stents. And here we are with the laser sheath. And we did use a laser. And look with the IVUS. Once you finally get IVUS inside that stent, you can see it's totally occluded. It's very dense material. It's chronically occluded. Now, we try to take biopsies in all these patients. And most of the time, it's intimal hyperplasia. It's not just organized thrombus. The, the body does respond to these stents. And here you can see that I take the time to get CT and prove that my sheath is inside that stent before I use laser. And uh, here we are making our way up to the top with laser, and we go up to the top, and it's, it's, it, it takes, a, you know, maybe 15 to 20 minutes to go up with laser once it starts going, and you have to be very careful it doesn't go through the struts. And we use the Spectronatics 2.3 laser. Unfortunately, it's not good for outpatient because it's a very expensive machine. The hospital has to acquire it. And we also use TurboHawk to get specimens of what's inside these stents so that we can prove to all of us we want to know what's including these stents to see if we can improve it, uh, prove our care. And here you can see where the TurboHawk has taken bites out of this. So here we are with the top of the common iliac and you can see the flow goes up through there. So in this case, these two stents were placed in the external iliac vein above the inguinal ligament or right there. No stent in the common iliac and no stent in the common femoral. And there was disease in both. So the, unfortunately, this physician didn't understand that concept <coughs> of stenting the entire uh, iliac system to the cava. Oops, what happened? So this is important to show you as well. This is a lady who had open cell nitinol stents placed in her left iliac vein. And you can see they're stacked. There's more than one. There's one, two, three, four, at least four here. She then relied on all of her gonadal veins for outflow. So this is a beautiful picture of what the body can do when you have occlusion there. And you can see this nitinol stent right here. See how compressed it is? These open cell nitinol stents do not. Let me follow. Quinze minutos. Let me do. Ta. So uh, here we are with the, another patient after almost 20 years of having these stents in. And you can see they develop restenosis here. And we did do specimens of this and send them to pathology. And the interesting thing, particularly in this young man who was stented when he was 17, now he's in his almost 40. Is it see again the turbo hawk pieces of uh, material that come out? It shows you that there is intimal hyperplasia in these stents. And the pathologist, Dr. Vermani back east, said there, these uh, veins are totipotential. They almost lack, act like arteries when they have stents, causing that constant pressure on the wall. So Dr. Camarota kind of chided me in. Uh, one of the meetings once and said, hey, we don't think that this is, only, we think it's only thrombus. We don't know if it's intimal hyperplasia. And you're saying it's intimal hyperplasia. And I really didn't know at that time. But now I call it venaplasia because it really is uh, stains with smooth muscle. And it looks more like intimal hyperplasia than it does like organized thrombus. And we have multiple examples of this from the pathologist to show us. So in, the conclusions are that our clinical follow-up needs to be scheduled for patients with stents. You can't let it go this far because it's so hard to treat these occluded stents. Whenever they come back to clinic and say, my leg is not as good as it was when you put the stent in a year ago or two years ago, 
It gets swollen, it takes longer for the swelling to go down. It's good in the morning, but by the end of the day, it's not as good as it used to be. We bring these patients in and we do a venogram and IVUS from the internal jugular, and we treat them so that with high pressure balloons, we get rid of that hyperplasia, and we open up the lumen, and it reduces the pressure, and you can then make them feel uh, clinically much improved because they don't have the venous hypertension that they had from narrowing that lumen with whatever is narrowing this, the uh, stent. So just in, in ending here, I just want you to know these are the only tools we have right now. There's a great opportunity for anyone to invent a new tool, but it's very difficult to, to do a startup. This is a new company doing the Zabelcath. IVIS has been extremely helpful to me. Spectronetics laser, we're asking them to make a bigger laser and a, and a cheaper laser. Of course, they just laugh when I ask them to do that. And I just want you to know that sometimes within these stents, once they've been narrowed so much, the balloons won't open it as well as I like. In a straight area where there's no compression above, you can use a stainless steel balloon expandable stent and it, it behaves very, very well. So I share that with you because you're all experienced in doing stenting and we're all looking for solutions to these problems. And um, there, I'm finished with that because I, I wanted to share uh, that last slide with you. So thank you very much. I went one minute over from what Fabio uh, told me. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you very much.